Hello and welcome. Uh, my name is Alec Jacobson from the University of Toronto, and this will be a short introduction to LibIGL. LibIGL is an open source C++ geometry processing library, and it's available on GitHub. Uh, let's go to the GitHub page and jump right in. So at the GitHub page, I can find the URL. Then I can clone the libigl repository. I'll do that here. And we can already get started uh, compiling some libigl code. So let's create a new C++ file. We'll call it demo.cpp. Then I'll put in the standard boilerplate for uh, C++ program. Um, here we go. And what we're going to do is we're going to write a function that will read in a triangle mesh from a file. It'll decimate that triangle mesh and then write it out to a new file in a different file format. Uh, so let's get started. So in libigl we use eigenmatrices to store the mesh. So the vertex positions will be stored in a matrix V. The faces will be stored in a matrix F. And we can read in a triangle mesh from a file uh, with a function called read triangle mesh. So I have that there. <clears throat> Excuse me. LibIGL is a header only library, which means to compile this code, all we need to do then is point the compiler toward where it can find this function, read triangle mesh. Uh, so we'll do that. And Let's give uh, compilation a try. So we'll close out of here. Then I'm on a Mac, so I'm using the Clang C++ compiler. LibIGL uh, is a C++11 application, so we need to tell the compiler to use C++11. Um, and then we can point it toward LibIGL, which we just downloaded, and Eigen, which I have ready for us. Oops, put an I here. And we'll name our output executable demo, and then uh, pointed toward the file that we just made. So it's compiling now. Um, we can run this. It won't really do anything right now. It's going to read in that uh, file and then not do anything. So let's change it to do something. So um, what we can do is we can write with just two libigl functions a conversion uh, app. So this application now when we compile will allow us to read in from one format and then write the uh, mesh back into a different format. So let's try that. Let's read in the bunny as an OBJ and then write it out as a PLY file. <clears throat> I have another libigl app uh, installed on my computer where I can view uh, functions based on their file name. So then we can see that we have uh, created that bunny. Uh, can try another file format so we can do STL so now we're converting it to an STL file um, and now we're seeing an STL great so we wanted to decimate this bunny so I'm going to go back to editing here and I'm going to add the decimate function and now instead of writing out the original mesh we're going to create a new mesh we'll call it D for decimate um, and we'll call the decimate function. So IGL decimate, we have our original mesh. We're going to decimate it to a tenth of the number of faces that we started with. And we're gonna give it the new mesh as output and uh, special bookkeeping uh, vector that will keep track of the faces that survived the decimation. So it's indices into the original mesh that will tell us uh, where each of the output faces came from. So that's our J here. Uh, most of the libigl functions are written in this way so that you can keep track of information as your mesh changes. Um, and let's actually write out the new mesh here. So now when we go back, we're gonna compile. Um, this time I'm going to add the dash o3 flag so that we get compiler optimization. Um, takes a second to compile. Okay, a few seconds to compile. And now when we run, uh, 
yeah, we can write an STL, let's call it decimated. And we can view our decimated model here. All right, so we have a decimated triangle mesh now. So let's hop back over to the presentation. <clears throat> so LibIGL is based around uh, mostly mesh operations. So we're representing 3D surfaces as triangle meshes. In uh, mathematics, we think of a surface as a smooth surface. On the computer, we need to discretize or break apart the surface into uh, discrete pieces. And we'll do that with many small triangles. We can store a triangle uh, mesh like this on the computer by storing the vertex positions and the faces. The way that we'll do that is for each vertex, we'll store the x, y, and z uh, uh, coordinates. Uh, and we'll do this for the first vertex, the second vertex, and all the vertices of our entire mesh. We can store all the vert vertex positions compactly in an n by 3 matrix of real numbers. And we'll call this matrix V. Now, uh, to form a triangle, we need references to the three uh, vertices that make up the corners of this triangle. So in this case, it would be one, three, and two. So this makes face number one. We can do this for each of our faces, and I'll, I'll point out as this pops up that orientation really matters here. So the reason that we call this one, three, two, instead of one, two, three, is that if we use the right-hand rule, the normal is pointing up away from the surface. We assume a counterclockwise orientation. Okay, so we have our face uh, number one, and we can do that for face two and three and so on. Can store all of these uh, references compactly in a matrix, an M by three matrix, where M is the number of triangles. Um, we'll call that matrix F. The elements of this matrix should be references into V, and since V was a matrix uh, of real numbers, we'll represent uh, each of the elements of F as indices into the rows of V. So F11 would refer to the F11 row of V. In our code, we can represent both of these uh, matrices uh, using the eigenmatrix type. And the difference will be the type that the eigen matrix is templated on. So we see here that the V matrix is supposed to contain real numbers. In the computer, we don't work with real numbers. We work with uh, floating point number numbers. And in this case, we're using a double precision floating point number. The faces, on the other hand, have an integer type because they index the rows of V. Both of these matrices uh, are dynamic in their number of rows. This is telling Eigen that we don't know at compile time how many rows it will have. In this case, I've uh, written that uh, we do know that both of them will have three columns uh, at compile time, but sometimes we don't, and often uh, it's just uh, simply shorter to write this using the Eigen uh, shortcuts matrix XD and matrix XI, which assume uh, dynamic rows and columns. Okay, so let's fill uh, V and F with some data. If we wanted to hard code a cube mesh, uh, we could store all the vertex positions like this and all the face indices like that. <clears throat> in this case, we know that, the, the, that there will be eight, eight vertices and 12 triangular faces on this cube. Uh, we could also read in a cube OBJ uh, from a file, and we saw that before in the coding example, that read triangle mesh will uh, store the contents of the OBJ into the V and F uh, matrices. If we look at what's inside of an OBJ of a triangle mesh for a cube, what we'll see is something very familiar at this point. We're seeing exactly the V and F matrices laid out in the OBJ format. LibIGL, uh, as one of its design principle, embraces uh, matrices as the primary mesh data structure. A lot of geometry processing is inherently uh, or ultimately linear algebra, and many of the functions uh, can be written in uh, the style of mapping input matrices to output matrices. So often a function in LibIGL will take as input a mesh represented by this V and F and output some other matrix or vector. So in this case, if we output a uh, matrix X, it might be number of vertices by one, indicating it's a scalar field uh, stored by vertex values over the mesh. So for example, if we were computing Gaussian curvature 
uh, over this elephant, we might uh, call IGL Gaussian curvature. The input is V and F, and the output X is a Gaussian curvature value per vertex. Sometimes the uh, output will be uh, the length of the number of faces. So in this case, we're computing twice the area of all the faces in this bulldog. So our output is number of faces by one. So a scalar field, but this time defined over the faces. The output might be a matrix. In this case, uh, we're computing normal vectors per face. So uh, we're calling IGL per face normals on V and F, and we're outputting a matrix where each row is going to correspond to the normal vector of the corresponding face. Uh, so we have a number of faces by three matrix as output. And of course, we can also have as output uh, something that's number of vertices by three. So a function libigel that might do that is per uh, vertex normals. LibIGL's core mission is to facilitate geometry processing research prototyping. Um, we see this as uh, forming our mission statement, and we can derive goals from this mission, and then those carry forward into our core design principles. We've seen a few of those principles already, uh, but I'd like to describe where these come from uh, and uh, give you a better sense of the organization of LibIGL. So our guiding goals are that, for one, we want very low barrier uh, to entry for our researchers. As researchers, we don't know yet exactly what we're designing, and so uh, it's very important that we can quickly test an idea. We don't want to invest a lot of upfront energy in, in terms of installing complicated libraries or building up uh, systems that might not be uh, worthwhile for the, for the test. Like if, if the test fails, we might have done all that work for nothing. Um, so a low barrier for entry in terms of install, installation, compilation, and use of the library. We also want to make as simple as possible data structures for our users uh, uh, to be able to uh, take advantage of what's in geometry processing. This is related to the low barrier to entry, um, but it also uh, gets to the core programming aspects of if you're building uh, some research code and you want to use one aspect of libIGL, we don't want you to have to convert to an entire libIGL paradigm just to use one function. So the API is always very thin for libIGL functions and very easy to convert between your data structure, whatever it is, and our very simple matrix-based uh, data structure. And then uh, sort of the complement of low barrier to entry is we want a really high ceiling. We, want, we do want researchers to be able to write the full implementation of their SGP or SIGGRAPH paper using libIGL. So we don't want anything about libIGL to fundamentally uh, prohibit our users, uh, research users from doing that. Okay, so these guiding goals lead us to libIGL's four uh, core principles. The first of which we've already seen is this simple matrix-based API. So this was the example of per-vertex normals. We store our mesh in this very simple format, and the output is also a simple matrix. Basically, the idea is that if you know how to read or write your data into an OBJ, then you're off to the races with using libIGL. You already know how to convert your data structure to and from the V and F uh, matrix format. So uh, this gets at our low barrier to entry. Hopefully you can just immediately start using these functions. The other aspect was making sure that installing our library is dead simple. Uh, LibIGL is set up as a header-only library. We saw how easy it was to just download the library, um, point the include path at LibIGL, and immediately start compiling and running code. Um, so if, if we uh, want to uh, compile this function that reads in a triangle mesh and computes per vertex normals, all we need to do is include these two uh, headers in libIGL and, as I said, point the compiler to the uh, include path for, for libIGL. Uh, what we also saw in that example is we used two libIGL functions and we included two libIGL headers of exactly the same name. Um, this makes it very easy for us to find where these functions are and to make sure that we're not dragging in uh, too much code just for one particular function. So libIGL is designed with this one function, one file, uh, functional style of, of programming. So 
Um, the per vertex normals function is located in the per vertex normals header, and that's exactly the header that you would include if you want to call that, uh, that particular function. The last pr uh, principle is that we want minimal and compartmentalized dependencies. So libigl is built off of the eigenlinear algebra library, and we use the standard template library uh, as well. Um, but all of the functions found in the uh, main IGL directory only depend on STL and the eigen. And that roughly uh, uh, accounts for about 70% of libigl. So most of libigl uh, just depends on STL and eigen. The other aspect is comp com compartmentalization. Um, so those functions that depend on something more than eigen and STL will be located uh, in a directory named after that dependency. So for example, the tetrahedralize function depends on an external uh, piece of software or, or library called tetgen, um, and that means that that function uh, uh, is found in the tetgen directory. And the namespace is also prefix, prefixed uh, by tetgen. So you would call IGL tetgen tetrahedralize. So this indicates to the caller where to find the function and what uh, uh, external code that function would depend on. This is very important for any of the code that depends on copy left uh, GPL type of licenses. So these kind of pervasive licenses are uh, uh, often difficult for commercial users or people that want to release code. Um, and we've clearly demarcated uh, any of these functions, like for example, our marching cubes uh, implementation in the copy left directory. Um, this serves as both a namespace and an include warning for people uh, that are worried about the license of the code that they're using. All right, so it's useful also, I think, uh, to say what libigl is not to give you an understanding of what it is. So libigl is not a new fancy mesh data structure. We're not making any claims that this is the one data structure you should use. Uh, in fact, it's kind of the opposite. Uh, we're making an argument that, uh, that using a very simple data structure uh, can make it very fast for research prototyping. Um, so this data structure, you, you can see it as an implicit uh, sort of struct of arrays. So rather than having one mesh object with all sorts of different uh, uh, member fields and so on, the concept of a mesh is, well, whatever data you currently have associated with the, vert the vertices, faces, and edges of, of your mesh. Um, each function takes as input not this uh, monolithic mesh data structure, but just enough data uh, to compute whatever it needs to compute. So for example, the per vertex normals takes both the vertex positions and the face indices, uh, and this is the way that it can gather up enough information to compute the output, uh, which is the, the set of, uh, of vertex normals. On the other hand, the uh, is edge manifold function, which returns whether or not a, tri a, mesh, a triangle mesh is manifold, uh, only needs the combinatorial uh, information about the mesh, so that only takes as input f. It doesn't need v or any other uh, uh, mesh data. Uh, similarly, bounding box only needs the geometry of the mesh, uh, and so that type takes as input just the points or the vertices v. Uh, libigl is, is not a standalone application or app. Libigl is a library uh, for research prototyping, so it's meant to serve people that are building up code, uh, not a specific user of an application. Um, so you shouldn't see libigl as a replacement uh, for mesh lab or mesh mixer, although many of the parts of uh, libigl uh, uh, could be used to develop features for either of those applications. Um, libigl is also not a commercial tool in the sense that uh, it's free. Uh, we release it under the uh, Mozilla public license number two. Um, but it's also, uh, in terms of our audience, we're not uh, developing libigl to serve any particular industrial uh, application or uh, uh, commercial application. Our primary audience is researchers who are developing research prototypes. Um, it's also free for commercial use, and we do have commercial users um, that take advantage of some of the great algorithms uh, from the research community that we have implemented in libigl. 
LibIDL is great for things like testing a new uh, geometry processing research idea. Um, we have set up a special GitHub repository uh, called the LibIDL example project, um, which uh, sets up a README and a, a main CPP and a CMake build system that you can use as a template uh, for building your next uh, libIDL-based uh, idea that you'd like to test. Uh, so you're welcome to use this uh, template or fork it, um, and it'll have everything set up uh, to run a libIDL uh, application. Let's go back to the slides. Um, libIDL is also great for developing the full application for testing out your idea. So. Um, if you're uh, working on a paper or, or a project, you could consider using this libIDL example project. And there's uh, one particular example um, that I'll point to here uh, is an example of a project built off of libIDL um, that's for uh, seamware edge decimations. The authors here have uh, written a paper and the application that they've uh, produced as part of their research depends on libIDL and as well as IGET. LibIDL is also great for graphics or geometry processing coursework. So I aim this particularly at people that are developing courses or homework for their assignments. Um, and I would encourage you uh, to have a look, look specifically at the open source courses that I've created at University of Toronto for geometry processing and computer graphics. So for example, if I go here and look at the computer graphics page, um, I've created eight different assignments that are built off of uh, LibIGL, so students, let's say, can uh, take a look at the bounding volume hierarchy assignment. Um, and in this case, LibIGL is pulled in as a sub-module, so it's easy for students uh, to compile. And then uh, we separate uh, the skeleton for students in terms of uh, having header files that describe uh, what their function uh, should do, and then a corresponding uh, C++ file, I forgot which one I clicked on, I think it was this one, um, that has a place for the students to write their code uh, to fill in the blanks. Um, I found that this uh, uh, one function, one file also works really well uh, for uh, creating homework assignments and uh, makes grading incredibly simple compared to other types of organization. All right, so the last thing that I'd like to show you is LibIGL's online uh, tutorial. This is a large document that tours the major features of LibIGL and serves as a great uh, longer form introduction than this video uh, to uh, really getting the most out of LibIGL. So you can view the tutorial online, but I encourage you to also clone the uh, library so that you're ready to, uh, to run the code. And we'll see what that looks like in a second. So, uh, if we start, the uh, first chapter contains uh, uh, many of the things that I've been uh, talking about here, uh, and also some uh, basic descriptions of getting things compiled, um, descriptions of the mesh uh, representation we're using, um, and then a few uh, pointers to how to use the libIDL viewer, which is our basic uh, mesh visualization tool that's used to make the interactive applications uh, in the tutorial. Um, so if you scroll down to the different chapters here, we've organized uh, LibIDL features by topic. Um, and each of the subsections, so for example, if I go to, let's say, the parameterization chapter, and I look at the sub uh, subchapter on harmonic parameterization, I'll see a small description of the algorithm that LibIGL is implementing. Uh, descriptions of which functions are doing that inside of libIGL, and maybe a animation or, or some screenshots of what the demo of that tutorial entry uh, would look like, and always a link to that uh, tutorial entry's code. But that's so you're seeing a tutorial entry uh, for the particular example. So uh, we're looking at uh, the harmonic parameterization. Um, this contains a small libIGL program that includes the relevant uh, functions that we're going to call and also the viewer. Uh, and then we can walk through what this function will do. It's going to load in a triangle mesh here. So we're loading that E and F. We're finding the boundary on the outside of, uh, of the model. 
we're mapping that boundary to a circle, and then we're calling the harmonic function to compute a harmonic parameterization of this mesh to the plane. Um, we invoke the viewer by setting the mesh, setting the UV coordinates that we just computed, and attaching a key press command that'll allow us to toggle between viewing the 3D geometry and viewing the 2D parameterization. Uh, and finally, we can run uh, this example. So I've already downloaded uh, libidl and built the tutorial. Uh, so here I can call tutorial, then 501, I believe, uh, to run this example. So here we see uh, the example. It's a camel head. This is the boundary down here that's being mapped to the circle. And if I push 2, then I see uh, the two-dimensional mapping uh, uh, where we're defining the checkerboard. And if I push 3, then we're going back to the camel's head here. So we're seeing a uh, camel with the texture from this uh, 2D parameterization. All right, so if we go back to the tutorial, we can see that there are many, many, uh, sorry, as it loads, uh, many, many different uh, tutorial entries here. Most of them have the same flavor, so there'll be uh, one or two functions that are actually called in the small example, uh, and then a simple way that you can use the viewer to interact with the example. Um, some of these are quite fun uh, and animated. Uh, the most recent one, if I can pick here, is uh, this. Uh, a brand new addition to libigl is an implementation of direct delta mush. So this is a, a, a hot off the press uh, method for doing uh, skinning transformations. There's a description here of the method and then an animation of what you would see if you ran this locally. And why not? Let's run it locally. So let's look at example 408. Um, so if I look at the code, we'll see for 408, there's just a single CPP file here, um, reading in some uh, example data, uh, computing some pre-computation, and then at runtime, evaluating the direct delta mush uh, function. If we run the executable that's been built, we will see this playing, hopefully, live. There we go. Push spacebar, and we see it go. In this example on the left, uh, we're seeing a, what's called a piecewise rigid deformation according to the skeleton in the middle. Each point on the shape is just rigidly attached to the bones. Direct delta mush is uh, a very uh, nice way of computing a smooth deformation based just on the, these very naive weights. Let me pop back to the presentation. So uh, hopefully you have a chance to look through the LibIGL tutorial online. I encourage you uh, to do that after uh, downloading the code. Um, and uh, thank you all for your attention and watching this video. I hope to see many of you at the question and answers session live uh, at SGP 2020 uh, this coming Monday. Um, if you can't make it there or if you see this video after uh, SGP, I'm very happy to answer your questions. You can leave them on YouTube, or you can go to our GitHub page uh, and file an issue uh, and ask your question there. Thank you very much.